The first casualty of war, it's often been said, is truth. Now, there was no American Goebbels spreading hate and poison, but Uncle Sam was in the propaganda and censorship business. New agencies in Washington sprang up. One created documentary films designed to boost morale. Another regulated movies. During the war, Hollywood turned out literally hundreds of uplifting patriotic pictures. America was, after all, the world capital of entertainment and popular culture. The creators of comic books, greeting cards, and advertising were not slow to cash in on the war. Nor was Tin Pan Alley. What America needs, said a congressman after Pearl Harbor, is a good five-cent war song. Good or not, Americans heard hundreds before the war ended. Right from here to Alabama, oh, the son of a gun who picks on Uncle Sam. We don't care if it's Tripoli or Sumatra. We don't care if it's Tokyo or Siam. We'll sock the sukiyaki out of any diagram. Oh, the son of a gun who picks on Uncle Sam. Oh, the In songs and comic books and films, America's Japanese enemies were shown in a crude and lurid light. As iron ore is melted in furnaces to remove impurities, so in Japan, humanitarian impurities are burned out of the child. As the steel is shaped by beating and hammering, so is the boy hammered and beaten into the shape of the fanatic samurai. to shoot, smash, and slug Jap superiority into all non-Japanese people. The Germans, too, were shown as brutes as a celluloid war was waged against the Nazis. Aimed not only at Hitler and his gang, official U.S. films targeted the German people, too. There must be no tenderness in you. I want to see in their eyes the gleam of the beast of prey. Brutality is respected. I shall spread terror. Today, Germany. Tomorrow, the world. Carl Schmidt got his soul. That's how the general staff, the big industrialists, the state officials, the landowners, the gangster chieftains, put their plans into effect and prepared Carl Schmidt for his generation's attempt to smash the world into submission. That's how Carl Schmidt was trained for conquest, just as his father was trained by the leaders of his generation and his father before him. Each generation accepting and adding to the German tradition. All the American commercial and popular arts were mobilized. Posters appeared warning the public to take care. Advertising cashed in, even greeting cards. And Tin Pan Alley strained to turn out patriotic and quickly forgotten tunes. They came chasing after trouble, and their troubles just begun. So the sun will soon be setting for the land of the rising sun. We did it before and we can do it again and we will do it again. So goodbye, Mama. I'm off to Yokohama for my country, my flag and you. Shh. Don't talk too much. Shh. Don't know too much. Boy, don't be too hip. Cause slip of the lip might sink a ship. Shh. Praise the Lord. As the ammunition, praise the Lord. As the ammunition, praise the Lord. As the ammunition, and the law stay free. 
So let's put the axe to the axis and teach them not to pick on Uncle Sam. The Office of War Information presents its director, Elmer Davis, in his weekly report to the American people at home and to America's fighting forces overseas. Mr. Davis. We've had another week of air war, the greatest air war that the world has yet seen, and its scale is still increasing. For six days and nights, American and British bombers based in England have been steadily pounding northwestern Germany, and the cities on the Ruhr seem to be in worse shape now than was any city in England after the Blitz of two years ago last winter. A German broadcast to the United States today tried to tell us that the Ruhr is really not very important. If the Germans are so anxious to tell us that it is of no importance, it's a pretty good sign that they're getting hurt, and hurt where they feel it most, in their industrial production. Veteran journalist Elmer Davis was put in charge of the Office of War Information presiding over all U.S. propaganda, including radio and film. Another agency, the Office of Censorship, advised the press and newsreels what the public was allowed to know. Latest pictures of the Battle of Tarawa in the Gilbert Islands. This phase of the battle, filmed under fire by United States Marine Corps cameramen, reveals something of the terrific fighting that took place in capturing this important base in the Pacific. Machine gun nests, wiped out by hand grenades. American Marines, veterans of Guadalcanal, destroying a force of more than 4,000 Japanese. American losses were heavy. Far heavier than the newsreel audience knew. Tarawa was, in fact, a bloodbath, costing 1,000 U.S. dead and 2,000 wounded. The Office of War Information created dozens of films listing do's and don'ts. Two pair. Each me. No good. Three seven. <laughs> <laughs> Take the loot, pirate. Well, time out for some food, gents. Let's break this up a little early tonight, boys. Frank and I are running up to his cabin in the mountains early tomorrow morning. Oh, Bob, I'm afraid we better call that off. I'm running a little short on gas. Oh, don't let that worry you. I can let you have a couple of coupons, but don't forget where you got them. Will the guy down at the corner take him? Sure, he won't ask any questions. I didn't put my license number on them, so they could just as well be yours as mine. Just a minute. Are these your coupons, Bob? Yeah, I'm giving them to Frank. I got plenty. How'd you get them? It's easy. I buy them. I don't know where the guy I buy them from gets them, and I'm not asking any questions. Gets me extra gas, get it? Yeah, I get it. Hey, wait, oh, wait a minute. minute. You haven't got the, the right guy who's to... up to his neck in this war effort. I've got every right. Oh, don't start waving the flag at me. I'm just as good an American as you are. I buy bonds, I give blood. And steal gas, the blood of our war effort. From our limited supply of available crude oil, we have to supply our armed forces with billions of gallons of aviation gas and billions more of a special all-purpose gas for our ground forces. And from that same limited supply of crude oil, we have to make toluene for TNT. Two dozen films like these were made by the Hollywood studios themselves with profits going to charity. Here, an infantry officer in Europe writes home to his mother. Believe me, today we've been through some of the real stuff. The fellows are asleep now. They're half dead with exhaustion. They're filthy with sweat and dirt. But take my word for it, Mom. They're grand soldiers, every one of them. Tell every woman in our town, from one soldier to another, that I'm proud of them all. <whistles> Say hello to Mrs. Zabinski. Tell her I think she's a good soldier, too. Say hello to Mrs. Carney, who organized the canteen down at the station. Yes, you're all good soldiers, Mom. We know how you're going without things so as to buy just one more war stamp or one more bond. I know what a kick you used to get out of new clothes. You're not fooling me now when you say you like your old things best. And you're not fooling me when you make exceptions for some of the other women in our town. There shouldn't be any exceptions. Just what does Mrs. Exception mean when she tells you she had to give up her Red Cross work because it didn't leave her time enough to get her hair done each week? And what does this other Mrs. Exception mean when she says she can't help at the canteen because they need her at the same time at a bridge party? And what does Miss Exception mean when she says she can't do a war job because they're all so monotonous and dirty? And what does this Mrs. Exception mean by complaining about high prices and then boasting of all the stuff she bought on the black market? These aren't exceptions, Mom. They're only slackers. 
The most famous and most widely seen of all U.S. official wartime films were the seven in the Why We Fight series, created by Frank Capra, director of such 30s Hollywood classics as It Happened One Night. Many of the industry's best writers, composers, directors, and editors worked anonymously on this series, which became required viewing for all military recruits. In the jungles of New Guinea... barren shores of the Aleutian, in the tropic heat of the Pacific Islands, in the sub-zero cold of the skies over Germany, in China and Italy, Americans fighting. Yet two years ago, many had never fired a gun or seen the ocean or been off the ground. Americans, fighting for their country while half a world away from it. Fighting for their country, and for more than their country. Fighting for an idea. At his studio in Vermont, America's favorite illustrator, Norman Rockwell, painted from life posters of the four freedoms which President Roosevelt had said the country was fighting for. Freedom from what? freedom of speech. Freedom from fear. And lastly, freedom of worship. Another American freedom available to all was the freedom to mock, to cut the pompous tyrants down to size. Band leader Spike Jones and his city slickers raised a democratic laugh, poking fun at their Fuhrer. When the Fuhrer says, he is the master ace, he higher, higher. Right in the Fuhrer's face, not to love the Fuhrer is the greatest case, so be higher, higher. Right in the Fuhrer's face. Are we not the Superman? Are you pure Superman? Yeah, we are the Superman. Super duper Superman. Is this Nazi land so good? Would you leave it if you could? Yeah, this Nazi land is good. We would leave it if we could. We bring the world to order. I'll hit this world to order. Everyone of foreign race will love the pure space when we bring to the world disorder. Führer says, he is the master race. Be higher, higher. Right in the Führer's face, not to love the Führer. He's a great disgrace, so be higher, higher. Right in the Führer's face. Hollywood went to war with a handicap. Film stock, the basic stuff of movies, was in short supply. So too were the leading men, the stars went off to serve. Nevertheless, Hollywood produced nearly 1,000 wartime pictures sent abroad to entertain GIs, including Irving Berlin's rousing This is the Army. This time we will all make certain that this time is the last time. This time we will not say curtain till we
This is Red Square in Moscow, where in peacetime the Soviet people celebrated the revolution, where they demonstrated their strength, health, and unity to the outside world. In the sinuous twists and turns of war, yesterday's hated Soviet Union became today's heroic ally, as the newsreels stretched the facts. In June 1941, this great isolated nation was treacherously attacked. Overnight, she mobilized. Tanks rumbled through Red Square, blotting out the patterns of peace. The young athletes in full fighting equipment marched off to stop the invader. While Hitler raced through Western Russia, the world wondered, what was happening behind the 2,000 mile front? How were the people of this vast young land standing up to the invasion? The world soon had its answer. The Russian people were facing the war with a calm understanding of what it was about and what they had to do about it. An army of women, 19 million of them, took over the farm work. They planted and harvested the crops, sunflowers, barley, wheat, to keep their armies in the field and their nation from starvation. Men too old to fight joined the land army. Five million children helped to bring in the harvest. My enemy's enemy had now become my new friend, Uncle Joe. Despite Stalin's crimes against his people, which you now know were on an even greater scale than Hitler's. Now Adolf got the notion that he was the master race, and he swore he'd bring new order and put mankind in its place. So he set his scheme in motion and was winning everywhere until he up and got the notion for to keep that Russian bear. Well, now Stalin wasn't stalling when he told the beast of Berlin that they'd never rest contented till they had driven him from the land. So he called the Yanks and English and proceeded to extinguish the Fuhrer and his vermin. That is how it all began. Anti-Japanese war propaganda became increasingly racist and ugly. We're gonna have to slap the dirty little Jap. And Uncle Sam's the guy who can do it. We'll skin that streak of yellow from the sneaky little fella. And he'll think a cyclone struck him when we're through it. We'll take that double crosser to the old woodshed. We'll start right on his bottom and we'll go to his head. When we get done with him, he'll wish that he was dead. We've got to slap a dirty little Jap. After Pearl Harbor, the army rounded up all Americans of Japanese descent. These children, Nisai, Japanese Americans born in America and taught American values, and their parents were herded into relocation camps. Official government films tried to justify the action. They gathered in their own churches and schools, and the Japanese themselves cheerfully handled the enormous paperwork involved in the migration. The army provided fleets of vans to transport household belongings, and buses to move the people to assembly centers. The evacuees cooperated wholeheartedly. The many loyal among them felt that this was a sacrifice they could make in behalf of America's war effort. Santa Anita Racetrack, for example, suddenly became a community of about 17,000 persons. The Army provided housing and plenty of healthful, nourishing food for all. It was not only racial animosity, but also worries about West Coast security, which took these people far from their homes, all tragically unnecessary. Naturally, the newcomers looked about with some curiosity. They were in a new area, on land that was raw, untamed, but full of opportunity. Here they would build schools, educate their children, reclaim the desert. Special emphasis was put on the health and care of these American children of Japanese descent. Eventually, the Army invited the Nisai men to train as GIs but they had to fight for the right to go to war. The 442nd Regimental Combat Team won a role in liberating Europe and proved that Nisai blood ran as red, white, and blue as any Americans. Finally, they became a fighting legend. 
Late in October, on the Vosges front in the west, there took place one of the heroic episodes of the war. A battalion of the 36th Texas Division had been cut off and lay trapped up forward in the hills without communications and surrounded by superior enemy forces. It was the 442nd Infantry Division that was ordered to cut a way through to them. This was the famous and unique battalion composed of Americans of Japanese ancestry, volunteers all. They were fighting as they had fought in Italy to prove their loyalty to their American homeland, to prove again that democracy embraces all creeds, all races. For nine days, while the Texans hung on grimly up ahead, they cut their way forward in bitter cold and in some of the toughest fighting country on the Western Front. And on the 10th day, they broke their way through. The lost battalion of this Second World War had been relieved. Tired men, tired to exhaustion, but unbeaten. And what of the troops who got through to them? The 442nd. They came out too when it was over, carrying their wounded. These too are the kinds of men about whom fine words are sometimes used. These two are Americans, and they've proved it with the full measure of their loyalty. At war's end, General Mark Clark honored the 442nd, which had earned over 3,000 Purple Hearts, 800 Bronze Stars, and the Congressional Medal of Honor, more than any other unit of its size. All of you Americans of Japanese descent have a right to be proud, for you have reached the high standards of American fighting men. You are always willing to close with the enemy. He has no bluff on you, and you've always defeated him. And let me tell you again, the 34th Division is proud of you. The 5th Army is proud of you. America is proud of you. Returning from three years of war service in Italy and France, the 442nd Combat Team receives a rousing welcome at New York. The veteran unit is made up of Japanese Americans, many from Hawaii. The hard-fighting combat team battled heroically through such tough assignments as Anzio and Casino and is returning minus one battalion. Its bulldog determination is expressed in its slogan, Go for Broke, meaning shoot the works. This was the hard-hitting outfit that rescued the famous Lost Battalion when it was cut off by the enemy in southern France. They accomplished the rescue with bare bayonets and suffered many casualties. During frontline fighting, 650 lost their lives and over 4,000 were wounded. Now they're home for a hero's welcome and a justly deserved one. Never in its history had the United States government assumed such powers over free expression and mass communication. War has a way of restricting individual constitutional rights. Yet there were very few public complaints. There was a war on, and we all believed, reporters, editors, movie makers, that it was in the national interest to withhold certain facts and to bend the truth at times. In the post-war years, some of our wartime propaganda about our allies as well as about our enemies came back to haunt us. Some was downright dishonest, some was simply racist. And when novels like Norman Mailer's The Naked and the Dead appeared years later, they were truly shocking to many readers because the American public had been sheltered from the real horror of battle. 